Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today on this presentation and discussion on how to keep your nonprofit systems secure while working remotely. I'm Nicole Jones from TechSoup, and I'll be your host today. I'm really glad to see so many of you here with us today. In this next hour, we're going to answer some of the most frequently asked questions while sharing practical measures that your team and organization can take to have the best defenses against cyber attacks. But before we get there, we're going to do a little bit of housekeeping on how to use our webinar platform, Global Meet. So all lines are muted, but if you have any questions at any point, we're here to answer them. You can just go ahead and type them into the Q&A box um, or audience chat, but the Q&A box will be the quickest way that we can get your question routed to the right person. And if you lose your internet connection at any point, no problem. You can just reconnect using the link in your email. And you're going to receive an email with this presentation, recording, and links within 24 hours after this webinar. So anything you might have missed, you can go back, review it, and you can also share this with any colleagues, friends that you think would benefit from this information. Just a little heads up, we've noticed that our webinar um, presentation is formatted a little funny, so you might see that as you go through. So keep that in mind, but we'll make sure that we send you some fresh slides in the post-event email. So look out for that. And there's going to be lots of opportunities, as I mentioned, to ask your questions and other ways to engage with us on this webinar. So we're going to be asking questions to you via a poll throughout this webinar. But you can also participate by chatting your responses within the chat box of this webinar platform. Uh, again, responding to those poll questions that we'll be asking during and after the webinar. And then tweeting at us at TechSoup and using the hashtag TSWebinar and NPCOVID. And I think here I have um, TS Webinars, which we'll find it too, but if you can use TS Webinar and Stephen, who's assisting us on chat, will be adding that there. And then the hashtag NPCOVID and COVID-19 works as well, but we're focusing on those other two. So it'd be great if you can use that when you're tweeting at us. All right. So now that we have that covered, a little bit about TechSoup. We're a global network bridging tech solutions and services for good with more than 1.2 million nonprofits in 236 countries and territories benefiting from TechSoup and recognizing TechSoup as their unique resource partner. And to help make that possible are the more than 100 corporate donors and providers of software, hardware, and services who have chosen the TechSoup platform to create and grow impactful and kind donation programs. So thank you to any of you from those organizations who are listening today. We definitely could not do this work without you. You can check out all the great offerings from our partners by visiting Nonprofit Tech Marketplace at TechSoup.org slash get hyphen product hyphen donations. And we're going to be sharing lots of other resources and links with you. And Stephen, who's going to be assisting on chat, will be sure to be including those in the chat box. And in case you miss those, don't worry. We'll include those in our post-event email as well. So just want to also add, last thing, that uh, TechSoup is much more than just getting great deals on software and hardware for your nonprofit. We also offer online and offline communities for you to collaborate with. Um, in addition to TechSoup's free blog, webinars, forums, and articles with useful tech resources and tips, that plus our apps for good division called Caravan Studios where we collaborate with experts to create and curate relevant solutions that help communities around the world. And with that, on to introductions. On today's webinar, I'm so pleased to welcome Linda from Tech Impact as a Director of Client Solutions, um, Client Solutions and Education. Linda manages all aspects of client relations for Tech Impact, including educating nonprofits about technology solutions. She puts her three decades of technology and training experience to use by working with local, regional, and national partners to provide the nonprofit community with increased knowledge of technology. We're also joined by Marnie. She's the Chief Community Impact Officer for TechSoup, who also leads Caravan Studios, a division of TechSoup. And in her role, she works with communities around the world to describe desired impact and to develop technology solutions that help them move toward that impact. 
And they're joined by me, your host, Nicole, in addition to Stephen, who will be supporting us along the way. And we have a couple other fabulous TechSoup colleagues on the line helping to answer your tech questions along the way. And with that, I'd like to welcome Linda. Thanks for joining us. Hi, Nicole. Thanks for having me. Um, <laughs> I'm assuming I'm going to take over the uh, clicking through the, the PowerPoint here, so thanks. Um, it's all you. As Nicole meant, yeah, as Nicole mentioned, um, I work for a nonprofit called Tech Impact, and we are uh, our mission is to use technology to better serve our world, and we do that through a few different channels. We provide direct technology services to nonprofits across the country um, in form of planning, implementation, and support services. We also do nonprofit education and training. So we have some complimentary courses. So TechSoup has courses. We have courses as well. We, TechSoup's doing free webinars like this one today. We also provide free webinars. Um, and, and so we do that for the community. And then the last thing that we do is we do workforce development in three communities around the country. We're providing job training, placement, and, um, and placement services for young people to get their start in not surprisingly, technology careers. Uh, so that's a little bit about us. Uh, we're going to go through, and Nicole's got some polls going for us today. So um, we'll, we'll work, work through that as we get through the agenda. Uh, we're going to really just concentrate on today on um, cybersecurity, things that we're seeing happening as a result of this rapid deployment of nonprofit staff working, you know, not working in the office environment anymore, but having to work from home. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about phishing and malware threats, what we're seeing, the new stuff that's out there um, that you may not be familiar with yet. We're going to talk about how to securely use your computers from home and not cause some data loss. And then we're going to try to help demystify these things like VPNs and, and remote desktop connections. So that's the, the basis of our agenda today. So Nicole, here's poll number one. Great. How many of you go ahead and launch that. Yeah. yeah, great. So how many of you yeah, how many of you know what phishing is? Phishing with a pH, that is, um, and are thinking about it for your organization. So there should be a, a poll question or answer there that you could go ahead and answer that. And Nicole, I'm not seeing the poll results. I'm I'm assuming that you are. And you can yeah. give various facts. Yeah. yeah, great. Absolutely. So it looks like so far we're seeing 50% are saying, yes, I know what phishing is, followed by 23%. Yes, I know what phishing is. My organization requires staff training. Awesome. So we'll maybe just give a few more moments. I can send those results to the audience so everyone can see. I cannot, but that doesn't uh, that doesn't mean that others aren't looking at it. Okay, great. So I just yeah. I found the survey. Yeah, found the surveys tab here. So looks like the majority of folks on the webinar today, at some level, do understand what phishing is. So we're going to go ahead and talk about. I'm going to we're going to show you three or four slides here. Um, with some of the latest phishing attempts. So here's one that's an obvious fish. Uh, it, it's coming from a, an email address that obviously looks fake. It doesn't look like a Tech Impact email address. It's being sent to Tech Impact's executive director, um, and, and it's got some obvious 
uh, grammar mistakes in it and, and that kind of a thing. I think we're all pretty familiar with this type of a fish and can ignore it, can easily, easily ignore it. This one here is pretty fishy because it's coming from Singapore specialists. And I don't know, you know, may, maybe you've got business in Singapore, but most of us probably don't. Um, and it's, you know, it starts with dear sir, dear sir, dear madam, always is a pre pretty dead giveaway. Um, and then just, you know, kind of very bluntly go through the document and click here on this PDF. So that's also a, another phishing attempt. And this one, of course, is um, really being targeted to, you know, um, having you try to submit information and see if you're, you know, infected with coronavirus. So it's all about the coronavirus here. This one is not so obvious. This is a pretty good one that we got. Um, so it's, it says, uh, due to the coronavirus outbreak, company name. Now, your company name would be filled in here. Um, you know, is actively taken. It looks like it's coming from your HR department, and it's a pretty good attempt at tell, like making it seem like your own internal HR department has sent you some sent you some helpful information on how to stay so healthy or take action if you you know if you get coronavirus, and you're probably going to want to click the link that they um, put in here. So, how is this? Um, you know, how can we avoid doing this, and we'll talk about it later. Um, so we have that, and then finally we have some recreational fishing. Recreational fishing here, we have this slide in here because Netflix, everybody's asking me and telling me that they're getting free three, three free months of Netflix. Uh, Marnie, how's your Netflix working? Well, I'm still paying for it, unfortunately. Um, but the, um, yeah, we're seeing a lot of fishing that, as Linda said, that's well-timed for what's going on. So three free months of Netflix um, premium in response to everybody having to stay at home. But in fact, it's a pretty well-documented um, phishing attempt. Um, we've also been getting, I've been receiving emails both to my personal and work emails that to all appearances, or I live in California, are from the California State Department of Health. Um, telling me vital information that I need to know about our shelter in place. And those are, those are well-timed to the actual real announcements. So, you know, I started getting in the habit of actually looking at the link and opening up the email address so that if I'm getting it from any source that, that I don't know, that I'm, I'm really double-checking and making sure that I know that what, the, what the link looks like that I'm getting ready to, to click on. And you'll see often subtle misspellings in some of those links because it, that it is bait and um, people get people get pretty nefarious and pretty creative about how to how to put these phishing attempts in front of us and we expect these will just go up over over the next actually 18 months yeah that's it's absolutely going to happen and it's unfortunate because there are some legitimate you know, major corporations who are either lowering costs or, you know, providing free resources at this time of need. But as, uh, you know, I'm seeing the audience chat go through here, Marnie, while you're talking, and <laughs> somebody said it best. <laughs> if it looks too good to be true, dot, 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 <laughs> let's not do it. So I would err on the side of caution and, and not be tempted to, you know, get in on anything that is being, you know, is being offered via email without checking it out and verifying it first. So, um, so Nicole, you've got another poll. We're going to ask the we're going to ask the audience um, how many uh, of you have been seeing similar, uh, you know, phishing attempts. Yes, and that survey just launched. You can access it by heading over to your survey tab, um, or it should also just pop up on your screen. And when you want to see the results, it will be available on your survey tab. Starting to see some results come in. Looks like 50, over 50% 50 saying, I have been receiving similar types of phishing emails. But also 43% saying I haven't. So 
Yeah. Pretty good mix. So if you have, <laughs> that's great, right? If you haven't received a phishing attempt, maybe your organization has their, you know, their filters turned way up high um, on that, which is great. So it's one way to protect you. Uh, the next couple of slides that we'll go through here are, I, I copied this off of, of a, a really good website that, that I subscribe to. Um, some phishing bait. And I know it's a lot of words on the, on the um, slides here. We're not intending to go through this, but there's about six categories that are coming up um, as the most frequent type of phishing bait. Um, treatment scams, right? Anything, you know, how to treat COVID, uh, how to know if you're infected, where to go get tested. A lot of that is a scam. They want you to click on a link to see a map of the testing centers or they want you to, you know, fill out a form or something like this. And you're, these cyber criminals are trying to get, somehow get you to give them especially your medical information so that they can sell that on the black market or on the dark web. Um, supplies, you know, offering all of those kind of face masks and, and you know, uh, what, what are the, the, the sanitizer gel and all that stuff. Provider scans, again, trying to get, um, you know, acting and posing as if they are doctors or medical professionals is another um, category. A really big category that affects us as nonprofits is that charity scam. Um, donate now to help, you know, victims of the, you know, coronavirus type of thing. Um, all that is is really a big, you know, scam, and, and I'm hoping that, you know, they're not trying to use legitimate nonprofits for that scam. Um, apps, apps are a huge one right now. I can't tell you how many people immediately downloaded the app on Android um, phone so that they could see the live map of where the outbreaks were happening. There's no legitimate ones. They're all fake and they all hacked um, into your Android app. Um, Marty, what were you telling me about Apple? You said something about uh, Apple on the phone the other day. Yeah, um, the Apple uh, store has been super conservative and they've not allowed people to submit COVID-19 or coronavirus apps um, only health departments um, and, you know, institutions like the CDC or county departments of health have been able to submit them. And so that, and they're not just looking for things that are scams in the way that um, Linda's been talking about, but also mis and disinformation. They just want to yeah. make sure that they're not sharing stuff that's wrong that ends up putting people in danger as well as more nefarious activities. Yeah. So I'm, you know, good for them. I, I'm imagine Android is scaling back on that. But, you know, the Android platforms are scaling back on that too because it's, you know, there's just so many of them that been hacked. I can tell you, people that I know that are seemingly wise to this kind of stuff got all caught up in it. Oh, where is it coming next? You know, and they got into a, you know, what is that that, that fear thing, right? Oh, I, I need to know, and they got caught up in it. Um, so how can we stay off the hook? Well, uh, number one, only open email from known email addresses, right? Check the email address twice. If it, if it doesn't line up, if there's a misspelling in it or something like that, guess what? Just don't open the email. Check with your management team or your HR team or your IT pro before clicking on any links. And the way to do that is not to email them. The way to do that is to pick up the phone and call them or send them a message through Teams or Slack or, you know, Google Hang or whatever, you know, chat message that you have and ask them. Just say, hey, I got an email that looks like it's from blah, blah, blah. Is this legit? And just ask them for their opinion before you open anything up. Um, and then ask your IT professional uh, to configure your Office 365 or Google or other mail systems filters so that maybe you're bumping it up and, and they can put some tags in there, you know, COVID-19 or something like that tag in there to prevent them from even coming to your inbox. Uh, we're jumping into malware. Um, <clears throat> we want to make sure that you understand that anything that comes through social media right now, um, 
and has a link to here's a fake map so we're we're showing you a fake map this is the biggest one that that is blowing up the internet right now it's all over uh Facebook and Instagram and all those social media venues, you know, avenues where it's that, you know, hey, check out this map, and you're dying to see it, the map. You click on the map, and next thing you know, you're infected with malware. Those malware um, are, tracker, are, are tracking all of your credentials, and they're stealing your credentials from your uh, computers. And we're looking here at the next slide. We're showing you the escalation of these cyber attacks. And you can see, um, you know, back in whatever, December, January, how low it was. And then it's ramping up. And every single day, there are um, another couple thousand COVID-19 email or domain names being registered by cyber criminals. So a couple thousand a day they're registering. Anything that looks like, you know, they, they can get somebody to hit their website and then get infected. So just be careful. How, you know, and, and we want to make sure that we're staying safe. How can we be staying safe? Again, never click a link in an email unless you know what it is and who it's from. Uh, only get your news from trusted sources. Yeah, your, your, your social media is blowing up with this article about this fantastical, you know, case of coronavirus or this wonderful preventative, cure, you know, prevention or cure or something like that, and you, you really want that information. Don't use those links. Go and try to find it from a trusted source, so, you know, the, the cdc.gov. Um, those kinds of really trusted sources, um, your news, you know, your local news channel, make sure that you're typing in the web browser, your actual local news channel, that kind of a thing. Um, don't download any mobile apps. Um, and when in doubt, you know, guess what? Just delete the email. If you get an email that looks like a phishing scam um, and you're not really sure about it, delete it. If it's legit, that person is going to email you again or call you and say, hey, how come you didn't respond to my email? And then you'll know. Got anything else to add, Marnie? I heard a little nudge. I didn't know if that was you trying to chime in. No nudge from me. No nudge. Great. Nicole, you got another poll. How many of your staff are using their personal computers to work from home? So at Tech Impact, we provide um, IT support services to a couple hundred nonprofits across the country. And a, a large percentage of, of those nonprofits have moved to work from home status. These are workers that normally don't get to work from home. And they, they were rushed out of the office, um, you know, someday last week or this week, and they were told to go work from home. Some of them may have a laptop in the office that they could have brought home with them, and some of them don't. And now, you know, we're, we're wondering how many are actually using their home computer, their personal computer, to do work now that they've been sent home. And how's this poll coming out? Yeah, it looks like it looks like majority um, at least have a few, if not some, most or mm -hmm. all of their staff using their personal computers to work from home. Yeah, great. So this is a yeah, this is a big issue in terms of cybersecurity and also for your IT department, whoever's supporting your technology at your nonprofit to deal with. And so at, at, at Tech Impact, we, we, you know, first thing we thought of is how are we going to support these home computers? And what's the difference? Right? So you might be thinking, well, so what? Who cares? Well, with the home computer, or with the organization-owned computer on the left side of the screen here, the operating system is updated. You know, it's probably the latest version. It's a pro version, a professional version of the operating system versus a home version of the operating system. That operating system, your IT pro probably has automatic and scheduled updates happening, so they're patching 
the operating system, they're updating all the applications like the Java and the Flash and the Adobe and all of that kind of stuff. There's a professional grade antivirus or anti malware program running on the machine and also being maintained. So the updates are being um, done on a regular scheduled basis. The scans are being done on a regular scheduled basis. Whereas at the home computer, you might not have any antivirus or you may have a retail version, like a consumer version of, of antivirus, which is fine, but more likely than not, that antivirus has to be manually updated by you. You have to remember to do that and actually take action and take time out of your busy day to make that happen. The same thing with the Windows updates and the Adobe updates and all that. You have to remember to go into the update center for each and every one of those programs and look for the update, install the update, remember to reboot the computer three or four times till it all takes effect. Um, in the organization owns computer, there's some user authentication, usually by like your active directory or, directory or domain controller, or if you're in Office 365 or another cloud platform, Google, that um, system is is authenticating not just the user account but also the workstation account to verify that the workstation is allowed on the on the network. At the home computer, maybe it's open access. Maybe you share that computer with the kids, with the whole family, and everybody's using that you know same computer and there's not really a separate log on for you to use. That takes not just a security concern because if you're sharing that computer and the kids are not paying attention to the phishing scams and the malware and they're on social media and they're clicking the map that we just talked about, they're infecting your computer. Also, you're as an organization not sure how much of your company data or confidential data is being downloaded onto that local machine and possibly being compromised. So it's not just that the home computer may get malware on it, but if there's company or organization information there, that could go out as well. So th for those reasons, we want to make sure that you're aware of who's using a home computer and that you're taking actions to do something about that. And Above and beyond the computer, now we need to also talk about the home network and, and what that home network looks like. Is it, is it secure or, and or hardened? Um, so here are a couple of ways to harden the, computer, harden the home computer and network. Um, making sure that you're doing the updates every day. If you're using your personal computer at home, you really need to just know that it's going to take you somewhere between 5 minutes and 25 minutes every single day to go through all of your update routine and make sure that it's actually being done properly, rebooting the machine, et cetera, et cetera. Because of this COVID-19, the cyber criminals are out there in force. Every single one of the software vendors is doing their best to provide the up to minute up to the minute security patches. So you just need to know that you have to run this every single day. You're going to have to do the same thing with your antivirus, anti malware. Make sure you're getting the new definitions every day and you're applying them. For your network security, in your home Wi Fi network, a lot of us just leave that network open so that we don't have to bother, be bothered or inconvenienced by having to put in a password or tell our guests what the password is when they come over. Make sure that you do set up a, a password on your Wi-Fi. Also make sure that you change the default administrator account. A lot of us go out to a Best Buy or you know, on Amazon and we order a Wi-Fi, you know, a wireless whatever access point and we just plug it in and let it go. And I know what the admin credentials for all of them are because I'm an IT professional. I know it's admin, admin, or admin, you know, I know what those defaults are and some cyber criminals may know that as well and be able to hack in. If you need to connect to your 
company back to the nonprofit office to get to a program or files or something like that, you're going to want to do that in a secured way. And that's a, the, the next topic we'll talk about is how to get to your, to your data and your systems in a secure way. And so if you need to do that, you need to use an approved VPN or remote desktop connection. And, and, and you'll hear me talk, say that about another 100 times in the next five minutes or something like that. Some other basic cybersecurity tips that, uh, you know, again, because we're all, we should be doing the first thing everywhere, every minute of every day. We should all be using something called multi-factor authentication or MFA. Multi-factor authentication protects against compromised user credentials being actually used by the cyber criminal. So how does that work? You log into your system. Let's say it's Office 365 or it's Google. You log in, you put your username and password in, either Microsoft or Google then sends you something to your mobile phone to say, hey, you have to verify yourself. And then you either have to type a code in or click yes to go to the Google, um, to go, to go to the Google homepage or in your mobile device or something like that. That's the second step in the multi-factor authentication. Why is that important? Why does it work? Because if you did fall for one of those phishing scams or you did somehow lose your credentials and a cyber criminal found out what your username and password is to the Google account or the Office 365 account or the bank account or whatever, they could use their computer and type that information in, but they don't have your mobile device. So when that account get when that code gets sent back to your mobile device, they won't have that mobile device, and therefore they're not actually going to gain access to your Office 365 or your Google or your bank account. So that's multi-factor authentication. All of the vendors have some, some level of it. You can do that in your Google account, your Office 365 account. If you're banking with a, a, a bank or a credit union that doesn't have that, you should probably go find another bank. Um, I wouldn't want to put my money in a bank that didn't offer me uh, multi-factor authentication. So that's one thing. The other thing is to use, did somebody want to say something? No, okay. Uh, the other thing is to use something called a single sign-on or FSO. This is, a little more, uh, this is a little more sophisticated. It allows the organization to control which user has access to which cloud application by setting them up with something called single sign-on. It also allows each user to use one account to log into, one credential to log into multiple accounts so that as the user, I don't have to remember five or six or seven different passwords. And I don't write them down on Post-it notes and I don't share them with other people. I just need to know one account when I log in it logs me into, like for, for me at Tech Impact, I use Office 365 for my email and my file sharing, et cetera. I use Salesforce to keep track of all my contracts that I have to do. I use Expensify as my expense tracker. I use the same username and password to get into each one of those systems, and I only have to type it in once, and it logs me into all of them. Some, uh, so, so Office 365 does that natively. There's also another program that you can use called Okta, O-K-T-A, that you can set up and do that. So that's another nice security tip. Um, and the last one here is communicate, communicate, communicate. It's very important for you to keep in communication with your remote workers. And, and of course, we, you know, you should, we're not talking about this, you know, the, the social or the work place. Um, you know, reason for that. On this webinar, we're strictly talking about the security reason for that. It's very important for you, for us to make sure that we're sending information out to our staff to say, here's the latest scam that we found out about. Please don't, you know, please don't click on this link. Um, sending security alerts, etc. We've listed some resources here um, for you. There's a couple of um, 
links in this webinar that you should go ahead and, and feel free to click on. One of them is a government, um, a government website where they're listing all the latest scams that they know about. And then the last one there, preparerespondserve.org, is a microsite that Tech Impact and 501 Commons put together. And we're trying to keep that updated as well in the resources tab. Great. This resources um, slide here will be updated when we send out the, the, the webinar, sl the slide deck to you later. Great. Now let's talk about the difference between a, v a VPN and a rem remote desktop and why this is important to us. Um, Ms. Cole, you have a poll here about this, right? How many of you have systems or servers that are not in the cloud and are also critical to your operations. So you've got a server in the office or a computer in the office that hosts something like your financial uh, system or your client management, your donor database, that kind of thing. Yeah, that's all right. Surveys out and seeing some responses start to trickle in here. Okay, it looks like 65% say, yes, our organization does. About 26% saying, nope, we don't have any. Mm -hmm. Right. So at Tech Impact, we are all cloud. We have zero servers, um, what we call on-premise servers. Um, everything that we do is in the cloud. Um, we made that move uh, several years ago, um, but some things, some organizations don't, are, are not at that stage yet where they can get everything into the cloud. You might have some programs in the cloud, like your emails probably in the cloud, maybe your file sharing is in the cloud, um, but there's still a couple of things sitting on a server in, in the office. Now that the office is closed and you need to have access to that information remotely, we're going to talk about a couple of different ways um, to do that. And, and again, from a security standpoint, we want to make sure that we're making that connection back to the office as safely and securely as possible so that cyber criminals are not able to hijack our connection or get into the information um, that, that we're trying to get into as well. So there's two things that people have been, you know, a lot of people have been talking about this recently setting up a VPN or a virtual private network um, to get into their system or using something called a remote desktop connection to get into the network. And, and I'm going to make an attempt to explain both of these things to you with pictures. I hope it goes well. A VPN, is, VPN stands for virtual private network. What does this mean? It means that you're creating a tunnel to connect from your home computer into your company network. And the way that this is done is through a client on your home computer and a, a setup on your firewall in your office to allow that client to connect through. And so we're trying to show this on this picture here where on the left, that's your home computer. You're trying to make a connection you want to make sure you're going through that green tube there, which is the tunnel. That tunnel protects all of the information that's traveling across your internet connection from being spied on or, or, or intercepted by hackers and, and you know, government spies and that kind of stuff. For our purposes, it's mostly hackers that are trying to get to your stuff. So let's say you're trying to fill out uh, a, a I don't know, you're, you're trying to fill out a uh, financial thing. So you're trying to open up uh, your financial system and you want to you know, make some changes to that. That would be sensitive information that you wouldn't want intercepted. So you're going to use on the left-hand side a VPN client. So you're going to log in. You're going to use your home computer. You're going to open the VPN client. You're going to put your special username and password in. And then that's going to authenticate you 
to the firewall, and the firewall is in the little circle down in the bottom of the right-hand picture. That right-hand picture is supposed to represent your office network. So the firewall there has been set up to allow your credentials to make that connection. And once the firewall verifies you as an authorized user, it's going to open up the firewall. It's going to open a hole in the firewall just for your stuff to come back and forth. And then close it up again once you disconnect that VPN. So that's how a VPN can protect your information while you're using your home computer to gain access. Let's say you have a you know, QuickBooks or DonorPerfect or some legacy you know, client or case management system or something sitting on your server that you need access to. Or you have files there, spreadsheets and Word documents that you want to have access to while you're not at work. That VPN tunnel allows you to do that. The VPN needs to be set up by your IT professional on the firewall that you're using, SonicWall, Cisco Marathi, or others, and then you, they have to license you to have, to have use of that VPN client. And once that's done, the secure connection can be made. You can also use a VPN client to connect to the Internet the bigger Internet. So if you really want to be a secure connection to the Internet, let's say you're using Salesforce or Google or Office 365, and you want to be more secure than normal because of these challenging times, you can get a VPN client that will allow you to make a connection to the cloud as well. And again, these are licenses that you would need to purchase. The number one thing that you don't want to do with VPNs is get the free one. Don't Google this and try to find a free VPN client because you know what's going to happen? You're going to download that free VPN client and that VPN client is actually going to be the malware that steals all your credentials. So you definitely don't want to do that. I hope that that hey, made Linda. sense. Yeah. I might just put a question in there that someone asked on, on just on this note on the topic of VPN. Um, Love it. If, if 100% of our data is in the cloud, do we need VPN software? You don't need VPN software in normal times, like especially if I'm connecting with my work computer. You know, I, I think that's fine. It couldn't hurt to use a VPN client um, to, to connect, right? That's like uh, we call that belt, you know, wearing a belt and suspenders. If the belt breaks, the suspenders hold your pants up, if you know what I mean, right? So it couldn't hurt. <laughs> a lot of, a lot of times if we're trying to connect yeah, if, a lot of times if we're trying to connect to um we see this happening when, when users are working abroad and they're working from a country that may not, you know, that, that may have some sort of government spy, right? Um, they use a VPN client on their machine so that they can get through the firewalls undetected in that particular country onto, even if it's just Google or Facebook or whatever. So I'll leave it at that. I think you all know what countries I'm talking about. So that's a VPN connection. We we would recommend you use a VPN connection if you need to con if you need to go back into your office servers and get into information. Another option for you to get from your home computer to information that's in your office is using something called a remote desktop connection or RDC. Remote desktop connection works a little bit differently. In this scenario, maybe you have QuickBooks loaded on your computer, you're, you're the finance person, QuickBooks is loaded on your computer in the office, and the computer that you have in the office is a desktop computer. You go home, and you're trying to still work on QuickBooks. But you don't have QuickBooks loaded on your home computer. You need to have access not just to the program, but also to the company file that you're using to manage the nonprofit's finances. You could use a remote desktop connection, which is a different kind of client software 
to make a connection directly to your computer at work. How is this different than a VPN? This is different because when you're using the remote desktop connection, you're making a connection to your computer, not, basic, not to the firewall where you would have access to everything, but directly to your own computer. So A, the computer in the office has to be turned on remain on, no power saver, you know how like after 15 minutes your screen goes blank and it goes into hibernation, you can't, none of that can happen. It's got to be turned on and really be turned on all the time. You have to install a program on that computer and then at home you install the client on your home computer that is authorized to make a connection to your computer. That's called remote desktop connection. That remote desktop connection then, you use your home computer to, you know, you click on the client, it opens up, and then all you're passing through the internet are keystrokes, mouse clicks, and video shots of what's happening on the computer at the office. All of the work that you're actually doing when you're updating the finances, when you're you know, sending out a whatever, you're, you're, you're debiting and crediting, I don't know anything about accounting, Fixing the general ledger, I know that that's a word. Um, all of that stuff is really happening on the computer in your office. Nothing is ha actually happening on your computer at home. You're just using the mouse, the keyboard, and the monitor to make stuff happen in the office. That's what remote desktop connection is doing. It's still a good idea for if you're doing this, it's a good idea for you to only use approved remote desktop connection software. Microsoft, if you're using Windows, Microsoft has that, ability, that capability built in, and they have the remote desktop um, client built in. But you need to work with your IT professional to make that setup happen securely before you try any of that on your own. There are other programs that will allow you to do the same thing. Um, Team Viewer is one that we recommend at Tech Impact. It's got the most professional and secure settings that we know. Log Me In is another one. Go to My PC is another one. You've heard these. You've probably heard these brands being, you know, mentioned. They're all good. If you pay for them, you cannot use the free software. Some of them have a free software or a paid software. And most of us at nonprofits are like, why would I pay for something if I can get it for free? The answer is because the free version doesn't have the updated security that you need and won't allow you to do some of the things that you're going to need to do. Pay for it. It's 40 bucks or something like that. I mean, just pay for it. It's going to be better for you. So that's your remote desktop connection versus the VPN. Again, when in doubt, ask your IT professional which one you would be better off using. Some pros and cons here for uh, remote desktop connection. The remote desktop connection, a, a pro for remote desktop connection is that it keeps the organization's, organization's data actually in the office. Because remember, all you're doing is screenshots and mouse strokes and key, you know, keystrokes and mouse clicks. All the information is remaining in the office. So there's no um, ability for that data to hit the home computer and possibly be compromised either accidentally or maliciously be compromised on the home computer. So that's a pro of using remote desktop connection. A couple of the cons, lag time. Because you're sending mouse strokes and keys, you know, mouse and keystrokes and stuff, depending on your internet connection at home, you may like start to type something and it doesn't show up on the screen until a second or two or five later. So there's some lag time there, so you have to sometimes be patient depending on your internet connection, especially if you're allowing your kids to stream you know, videos and play games and do all that other kind of stuff when you're trying to work. Um, make sure that you have a remote desktop and approved RDC client like TeamViewer or the, or the Microsoft one. And depending on how 
far into this you want to get, you, it, this may require your IT pro to do some firewall configuration changes to open up some ports that might not normally be opened up, which could then, you know, um, lower your your security. So they, they may or may not want to do that for you. So uh, I think we talked about, you know, how we can, uh, the, the pros and cons for remote desktop connection. Um, best practices for VPN, again, I think um, using the uh, approved VPN client never using a free VPN app because they're usually just nothing but malware, um, and only using that VPN connection when you need it. Because there's licensing um, involved at the firewall, what you want to do is be kind to your coworkers, get on the VPN, do what you need to do, don't then go have lunch or something like that and leave that VPN connection open. Close it, you know, close out of it. Um, a, for security reasons, but, but mostly it's to, to allow your coworkers to get into what they need to do. Some uh, resources for us, uh, the VPNs, the, the, the firewalls that uh, we have most, um, most experience with are Meraki, we like Meraki because it's available through TechSoup at nonprofit pricing. It's a really good price. This is Cisco Meraki um, equipment and licensing that's a fraction of the cost that you would find it if you just went directly to um, Cisco for that. We also like SonicWall. SonicWall has a, you know, a low price just across the board. It's affordable to use and, and, a, and a professional grade, uh, a professional grade firewall. Um, so that's for VPNs. For remote desktop, again, I think I named um, all of these you know, already. So wrapping up, how do I make sure that the staff doesn't compromise systems inadvertently? Um, oops. So, yeah, I'm sorry, this slide didn't switch for me real quick. There it is. Um, make sure that all of your staff can, uh, you know, identify what the phishing emails look like. Make sure you're updating them to remind them that Netflix would never, never offer you something for free through an email like that. Using strong passwords, enabling multi-factor authentication on all systems, um, hardening your home network, and creating a policy to train staff. So I'll end with um, a, a resource that we really like at Tech Impact, and I know that TechSoup people love this uh, resource as well. Um, we use a cyber security training system called Know Before, and it, it allows you to provide training and do phishing tests on your, on your workers and really keep them up to date. And we've negotiated a, a good price on this as well, a nonprofit price on that. So I'm going to stop there. I know it was a lot of information to take in, and I'm watching this audience chat thing in, in the corner of my window, and there's a lot of great questions being asked and answered. Are any of those bubbling up to something that we w might want to share with the whole audience? Yeah, absolutely, Linda. We've got a lot of great questions, and thank you to everyone who's engaged with us so far. So we'll take some time to go through those questions. And reminder, we'll be around to hang out um, for a while to answer your questions, so definitely keep those coming. And also that we'll be sending a post-event email with these slides and a list of resource links. So you'll have that all at your fingertips. So no worries about having to try to copy them down real fast. You'll have them delivered to you within 24 hours. So yeah, let's, let's dive into some questions here. Um, starting with, okay, and I've seen this question come up in various ways, but what about IT resources for organizations that don't have anyone on staff dealing with IT or just in general, small nonprofits without 
really any budget for IT support. What are some recommendations there? Yeah, I, it's a it, it's a conundrum for sure because you you don't want to just um, leave it to someone on your staff to go Google this stuff because the answers that they get will you know could be fake, and so we you know it could we we just don't know. Um, we recommend that if nonprofits can't, really can't truly 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 can't afford a IT professional to help them out that um, you cultivate someone on your board of directors so we're always putting that message out to you know find somebody on your board of directors who really does have professional IT or technology either um, experience themselves or access to a IT pro that could you know do some volunteer work with you great all right, let's see. Another uh, comment really that someone made here, someone's offering a free update tool that he works with called Patch My PC. It's a free program that can keep 300 apps up to date on your computer. Linda, mm -hmm. Marnie, um, what do you know about this and should we be using these types of tools? Yeah, I've not heard of that one because because of the you know the circumstance that we're in we're an enterprise level managed service provider so we have you know our own tools I don't know Marty have you heard of any of that I I haven't That's heard of that one I think the thing that's hard is that you know gen generally speaking the, the advice you know somebody had typed it into chat earlier if it sounds too, too good to be true it probably is um, you know, using other tool. You know, anytime you're using a free tool, you should be, um, you know, careful that it's not phishing or scam. And I'm not suggesting this one is, of course. Um, but also understand what data they may be collecting along the way, mm -hmm. um, and what they may be doing, and make sure your organization is okay with the deal that you're making, um, because you probably are making some kind of deal. Um, and it might be fine with you. It might be fine for you to pay for that tool in terms of somebody logging what products are being used and where, or it might not. And it's up to your organization to make that call. Yeah, yeah, that's a great point. And like we are familiar with like SpiceWorks. SpiceWorks is a really great, you know, IT professor, uh, an IT tool that's free. But your trade-off is that you're getting hit. You know, you you get hit up with a lot of their, you know, ads and that kind of stuff, which might be fine. Yeah, that's again, those can be fine trade-offs. So just make sure that you're clear on what they are, um, so that you're not surprised by them at some point in time. Yeah. Great. All right. Another question that's been coming up quite a bit here are just some recommendations for antivirus, anti-malware software for Mac. Yeah, um, I see somebody wrote, don't flame me on this. <laughs> but I was told I don't need, you know, antivirus. And, you know, generally speaking, I, I think that that's the, the general conception here is that you don't. But, again, you know, we're living in different times right now. And so could you go out and find um, an antivirus program to install on your Mac? just for the belts and suspenders, you know, idea, it wouldn't hurt you. It, I don't think it could hurt you to add antivirus and anti-malware tools to a Mac, even if you don't think in normal times that you need it. Yeah, that's a, a sound measure there. So, yes, um, saw a couple questions on that. So I hope that that helps you just safeguard, take extra security measures uh, regardless of machine. So another question here is about the difference between remote desktops and virtual desktops, things like Citrix, mm -hmm. ah, Citrix mm -hmm. excuse me, MS, virtual desktops, and so on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so a remote desk, so with virtual desktops, a virtual desktop requires that you have a server that's serving those up to your organization. The Citrix, the VMware, 
the Microsoft um, virtual machine using a terminal server. All of those require that you have a server set up that is serving those desktops up to your, to your users. If you've been told to leave your office because of COVID-19 uh, you know, pandemic things and you're, you're being told to stay home and you haven't had an opportunity to set that server up, then it's going to be difficult for you to, have, for you to do that now. That's where, so remote desk, the difference is a server is required, required for virtual desktop and your IT pro has to have, have already set all that up versus remote desktop connection, which is like a one-to-one -one thing that you can do in, you know, kind of in a pinch. I hope I answered that. Great. Thanks for that, Linda. Another question here, is it better to use VPN on my home computer and then connect to a remote desktop? What are your thoughts on that? Um, yes, that's the belt and suspenders, absolutely. If you want to open a VPN, can, if you want to use a VPN client and then use your remote desktop connection, that's just going to be double safe. Absolutely. Great. All right, just a reminder, you can continue to submit your questions in the Q&A panel. We are still getting some great questions coming in here. Uh, you can also tweet at us at TechSoup and use the hashtags TSWebinar and NPCOVID19. We'll also look at questions there. And we are live tweeting to some of the highlights from today's webinar. So head on over to TechSoup on Twitter. All right, so moving to, let's see, we still have about, oh, five minutes for questions, at least live, but we'll stick around to answer them if you continue to submit them, so please do. Um, let's see, we've got a question about web root for Mac, very specific question. Any mm -hmm. thoughts on that, Linda? Yeah, I mean, we deploy web, we deploy web root for Macs um, as part of our enterprise solution. So yeah, I, I think it's a good one. Great. All right, and just got some really great resources and advice here for, coming from our um, audience chat, like from Jason saying, backing up data on a regular basis is crucial for continuing operations. So things like cloud-based backups, USB connected drives, very important. Just a Absolutely. reminder in addition to all this. Yep. Yep. Great. Yeah, believe me, we could do three more hours on this topic easily. <laughs> right. Yeah, Tr just trying to hit the hit, hit the most important things, you know, the most pressing things right now. Yep. Let's see, another question here about having a small staff, only three users. Um, Melissa asks, is VPN software still valid? And I know you've kind of answered this in multiple ways, but maybe for just specificity to answer Melissa on that. Is VPN mm -hmm. software still valid for a small staff? If you need to connect back to your office because there's something on the office server or the office computer that you have to have access to while working remotely, then yes, you should get VPN set up. And and don't, you know, and again, this is, this is one of those, oh, I'm gonna say it again. This is one of those times that we don't want to cheap out. We don't want to, I mean, I know as nonprofits, our first thing is how much is this going to cost me? This is not the time to worry about how much it's going to cost to hire somebody to help you set that VPN connection up properly. Because if you get compromised, the cost of recovering from being compromised is going to be more than what you spent to get it set up securely in the first place. I can't stress that enough. Um, and it, it's just, that's, that's the reality of it. We've got organizations who get compromised. My friend owns her own company and she got compromised. It took her two days of time and she had to pay an IT company to come bail her out. She went into it for over $1,000 paying them to come. Instead of just buying a $40 VPN client and setting it up properly, right? So, I mean, it's just one example of pay for the professional services, even if you don't normally. Do it now. Yeah. All right. And let's 
just take one more question here. Um, what are your views on password managers like LastPass? Yeah, I think that, you know, password managers are great. Um, we want to, uh, you know, our recommendation would be to, you know, find one that's used organization wide and not let everybody just, you know, make their own choice if, if you want to be able to control all that. So yeah, I, I think it's great. Great. Good. Well, yeah, continue to keep your questions coming in and we will we will manage to get to them. So thank you to everyone who's participated, engaged with us so far. It really is the best part of the webinar is to see your questions and also for you to share your resources in terms of um, some best practices at your own nonprofit. No one nonprofit is alike, um, but these are some really good common um, cybersecurity best practices that we hope you find helpful. So with that, if you can share one takeaway in your chat box, one takeaway that you're going to bring with you to your organization that just helps us know what piece of information you process and, um, yeah, what type of content we should plan moving so forward. So just one, one top takeaway that you learned today in the chat box would be really great to see. And also, if you can help us, again, by um, – preparing future content, and we've got our post-event survey that's going to launch once you close out of this webinar. So please take time to fill that out. It takes about 30 seconds, and that feedback really helps us. And lastly, um, we don't have the correct hashtags here, but I'll include them in the chat box. If you tweet at us, we're at TechSoup, and you can use the hashtags TSWebinar and NPCOVID19. And with that, we're going to wrap. I thank Linda and Marnie and for really all the staff that helped to put on today's webinar. So thank you, Linda. Thanks, Marnie. My pleasure. Just a note on our Have a great day, webinar. everybody. Yeah. Same to you. And we've got more webinars coming up. Check them out. You can also go to um, community and events on the TechSoup website to view all of our webinars and register there. So with that, thanks again for joining us. And we look forward to seeing you at our next webinar. Don't forget to fill out our post-event survey. Thanks again, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye.